Welcome to Wisconsin DNR's Wild Wisconsin Off the Record Podcast. Information straight from the source. episode of the DNR Wild Wisconsin Off the Record Podcast. So as a reminder for everyone listening, um, this gives us an opportunity as DNR staff and also we usually bring partners on as well to give you kind of an inside look at the work done on the ground in the office by DNR staff uh, to kind of help you enjoy the outdoors, whether you like to hunt, fish, hike, uh, bird watch, anything under the sun. Uh, we just want to give you that behind the scenes look. We've got tons of staff, tons of topics. So today we are going to cover wild turkeys in Wisconsin. Great topic, uh, a really cool story of recovery. So we are joined today by Mark Waiteka, the Department of Natural Resources Upland Wildlife Ecologist. So like I mentioned, we're going to give you an overview of wild turkeys in Wisconsin uh, from their history to where we are today to kind of some of the management activities. Uh, that DNR staff do every day. So, Mark, do you want to just start a kind of what you do at DNR, how it all ties in, why you enjoy it, kind of the importance of of working with upland wildlife? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So as the upland wildlife ecologist, I'm responsible for management of our upland game species. That's primarily our our resident game birds that I focus on. So pheasant, uh, quail, turkey, ruffed grouse as an example, Um, also cover some of our small game species such as rabbits and squirrels, and then um, uh, another element of my position is uh, covering farm bill programs and policy as well. Some people think that's kind of a strange marriage, but um, we know even through some research that uh, farm bill conservation programs can have pretty big impacts on some of our upland game species, specifically our our grassland upland game species such as pheasants. So uh, for me, um, what drew me to the position, why I love what I do, is uh, I have a very strong passion for upland game bird hunting. Um, I, I've trained and worked with uh, pointing dogs in the past, and um, for me there's just nothing more rewarding than training a dog from uh, the time it's a puppy, taking it out into the field with you, and harvesting game, and, and cooking that up as, as a meal for your family. So um, I've, I've always had a strong passion for, for upland game bird hunting. And that's really what uh, what drove me to this position. Uh, some of the other things that I, I just really enjoy about my job is just how collaborative in nature it is. I get to work with not, not just a lot of other people in the department, but with a lot of stakeholders as well and with hunters to, uh, to address topics that we're all very passionate about. Um, and certainly I think if you were to ask any wildlife biologist why they got into this field, um, they tell you it was ultimately about passion for the resource and um, just hoping to make a difference in, in the world that we live in. So, Well said. So I think the dog connection is a big one for a lot of people who yeah. enjoy um, upland hunting no matter what species. So I think that's cool that you have kind of that experience. So kind of moving, moving forward here. So DNR Upland Wildlife Ecologist. So can you explain maybe for the people listening kind of what that position looks like? Uh, we're, we do we do our best to try to explain kind of the work biologists do in the field, but there are also very important kind of tasks being done in the office. So mm-hmm. um, can you explain your role? Um, you mentioned you manage other species other than turkeys if you want to get into that. I know we're gonna we're gonna focus on turkeys today, but um, I think there may be some crossover in management mm-hmm. that maybe you can touch on. So do you want to kind of just explain to give people perspective of, of what your position looks like and, and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. I guess uh, it's highly variable from a day-to-day basis, and that's something that I also enjoy about my job. It uh, keeps me on my toes. I, I'm usually addressing something new every day. So um, I, the way I kind of look at my position is uh, it's broken down into the biological aspects of the job and the social aspects of the job. And um, I think that's where you know the statewide administration of these programs um, we deal a lot more with the social aspects, I, I think. So that may be things such as um, working with stakeholders, fielding calls from the media, um, 
possibly uh, you know administering turkey and pheasant stamp funding as another example revenue that's brought in from from the sale of, of stamps that goes back to habitat management for these species mm -hmm. so it's really highly variable but um, you know a strong component of, of so, strong social con component of working with hunters working with stakeholders we have a variety of advisory committees that I chair um, all to bring together stakeholders to the table to help uh, inform management decisions on these species. Mm -hmm. And then you know, more from the biological side too, um, you know, I, I may be out helping with surveys one day or, or analyzing survey data, uh, producing reports from, uh, from the, some of the surveys or harvest reports that we, that we put out as well. So you mentioned advisory committees and I think that's a good segue kind of moving forward here. So um, if you didn't listen to actually the, the most recent episode we did, we did it with our large carnivore ecologist, Scott Walter. And a lot of what we talked about is kind of tools the department has to manage species, um, how they work with the public, kind of how that intertwines with the science that we have at the department. Uh, so can you talk about, um, maybe for turkeys in particular, what tools do, does DNR and do you as the, as the upland wildlife ecologist, what tools do you have to manage the species and kind of what are all the moving parts at play there? Yeah, certainly, you know, the advisory committees are one of the first things that come to mind because, again, this is, these are um, diverse groups built up of, uh, of stakeholders as well as department staff to um, make recommendations to the department leadership on how to address issues with these upland wildlife species. So that's one great method we have for gathering input and making informed decisions um, certainly, we have management plans that we put together. Uh, for Turkey, we've done a fairly recent management plan, and it's a really great document. It's, um, it was produced more as kind of a, a popular publication than a scientific publication. Lots of great facts and figures in there, and it's something you could actually pick up, read, and enjoy. It's not something that you'd uh, maybe crack and read a few pages of trying to put yourself to sleep at night. Um, but when we develop these management plans, uh, there's a lot of public input involved, a lot of advisory committee involvement, so that gives us an opportunity for, for folks to weigh in on these issues as well. And then certainly working with partners like the Conservation Congress uh, through their spring hearing process, uh, the department can ask advisory questions through the spring hearings, and that's another way that we can engage the public, get feedback from them on... Um, on their interests, their desires uh, for, for wildlife management in Wisconsin. So using management plans as an example, because a lot of what we're trying to do with these podcasts is give people an inside look um, at maybe how a lot of these management decisions are made and who's all at the table, including them. They definitely have options there too. Can you kind of go into a little deeper what a management plan looks like? So is that made up of recommendations, kind of a, a slice of the population at the time, or... Yeah, um, you know, a lot of times we'll look at uh, historic trends in population in, uh, in harvest if, if it's uh, pertainable to that species. Uh, so kind of giving maybe just, I guess, a, a, a history of the species um, and their current population status, what, uh, what sort of monitoring efforts we have in place for them, certain surveys that are done for the species. Um, but yeah, certainly I, I see the, one of the big critical roles for management plans is defining how we move forward with the management of that species, whether that's maintaining what we've currently been doing or taking new approaches, um, identifying future research needs that could help inform management decisions about the species. So is it safe to say that the management plan kind of provides um, a blanket of, I don't want to say recommendations, but so that management plan, which uses public input, the advisory committees involved, uh, partner groups are involved, so that all goes into this management plan, and then that then guides, does that guide management on the ground, quotas, things like that? All of the above, yeah. Um, more of the, it can, it can help direct the, the habitat management on the ground as well as more of the administrative, the policy issues as well for statewide administration of these programs. Okay, very interesting. So I want, I want people to kind of let that soak in too. I think that's a process that people may not be familiar with. Uh, management plans, your opportunities for public input. We're going to talk about kind of the social, social factors involved with managing uh, game species towards the end here. I think that's really interesting and I'd like to touch on that too. So why don't we back up a little bit. So can you give kind of a high level overview of the history of wild turkeys in Wisconsin? Because it is 
an interesting story. A lot of people like myself um, who may not have grown up during, I don't want to say the dark years, but we, it's pretty darn good turkey hunting in Wisconsin right now, and it wasn't always that way. Yeah, you don't have to be that old to uh, to remember a Wisconsin landscape that was devoid of turkeys. Um, I guess, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting history and really one of the great success stories, I feel, in wildlife management history as well. Uh, Wisconsin, we had, uh, we had pretty much seen turkeys extirpated from the landscape by the late 1800s. Um, and I'm going to stop you there. So extirpated. Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? They were regionally extinct, essentially. Okay. They were uh, entirely removed from the, from the state of Wisconsin for a, a few reasons. Um, one, unregulated hunting. Um, they, were, they were pretty well decimated from that as well as uh, changes we saw to the landscape. Some folks may be familiar with the Great Cutover, uh, where basically all of the forests of Wisconsin were, were cut in a fairly short time period, which drastically altered the, the wild, you know, wildlife habitat and, all, and then, of course, uh, wildlife populations on the landscape. So um, all of these factors led to this species um, disappearing from Wisconsin's landscape by the late 1800s, early 1900s. There were a few attempts at reintroducing them uh, throughout the early 1900s. Most of them failed. Um, oftentimes they were using domesticated birds to try and reestablish a wild population, which uh, generally speaking for all upland game birds just does not work. They, they tend to lack the survival skills that are needed to persist on the landscape. So, um, but by the, by the mid-1970s, we saw a lot of states taking an interest in turkey reintroduction. We learned a lot about their biology. Up until that point, the only real remnant turkey populations left were in very remote areas, such as uh, Appalachian Mountains. So there was this conception out there that um, turkeys need these large scale, uh, really large, untouched virgin tracts of timber for them to persist on the landscape and we now know of course that is not the case they handle mm -hmm. fragmentation human um, human impacts on the on the landscape quite well so as we began learning about turkeys and that their requirements are probably not nearly as um, as uh, rigid as we thought they were uh, we saw a lot of states start start to explore reintroduction efforts in the in the 1970s or so and Wisconsin was one of those states. Uh, we struck a deal with Missouri to exchange some rough grouse for some wild turkeys. The birds were introduced into southwestern Wisconsin, what, uh, what looked like pretty ideal habitat for turkeys, and the population just exploded. <clears throat> the, um, the population continued to grow on the landscape. We did some movement of birds within the, within the state, too, uh, moving them around to the north, for example. So... Uh, we now have turkeys that uh, exist in all 72 counties of the state. And uh, historically, if you look at their range in Wisconsin, they would have occurred, uh, if you were to draw a line from Prairie du Chien up to Green Bay, everything to the southeast of there would have been historic turkey range. But now we have them in all 72 counties in the state. So the reintroduction was more successful than I think any of us ever imagined it could be. And now we have um, you know, world-class turkey hunting here in the state of Wisconsin and I'd be remiss if I didn't, uh, didn't thank the partners that were really actively involved in that effort, not just Wisconsin DNR and Missouri Department of Conservation, but that effort never would have launched if it wasn't for hunters and for groups like the National Wild Turkey Federation that, that got involved and helped make that effort possible. So you mentioned regionally extinct as kind of that definition of extirpation. So just to rewind a little bit here, so you mentioned um, there were isolated populations, you mentioned the Appalachians, so what at its absolute lowest do we have a good feeling for kind of where the turkey population was at at absolute rock bottom or was that just isolated to to our region so would that include like surrounding states or was it mostly wisconsin as far as where the birds were were gone from yep. yeah i'd say regionally they were they were pretty well gone areas that were seeing active conversion to agriculture active uh active um, logging um, likely would have seen declines in the populations at that time. I think it's safe to say that regionally turkeys were, were probably pretty well gone. Mm -hmm. So the recovery efforts, um, it's, it's a really cool story. Like you said, a lot of people at the table really fighting hard for that and putting in a lot of work and time. So can you expand a little bit more on, so you mentioned there was a grouse trade for turkey. And just to digress for a second, if you follow our Instagram, we actually shared a story 
of a 95-year-old hunter <laughs> whose farm was one of the first to receive turkeys in that deal. And so it's 2018 now, and he just harvested a 24-pound <laughs> turkey. So he is... <laughs> He has really gone start to finish and yeah. is, is still going at it. So just a really cool story and an example of someone who really saw the beginning to the end, mm -hmm. which is really cool. So recovery efforts, um, you mentioned the great cut and things like that. So obviously we're not just putting them in a semi and dropping them off in southwest Wisconsin. So what? how does that look? So how would that process have looked as far as getting these turkeys on the landscape and doing everything that we, being DNR and the partners, could do for them to really take to that habitat. Yeah, well, from the trapping perspective, these folks were out there using traps in Missouri, you know, day in, day out, getting whatever birds they could, uh, and basically loading them in a truck and bringing them back to Wisconsin as quickly as possible because we know that uh, upland game birds in general do not handle being in captivity all that well. That puts a lot of stress on the birds. So um, the objective would have been that it get them here as, as quickly as possible. But um, yeah, in terms of uh, releasing them in southwestern Wisconsin, it required a lot of coordination. In southwestern Wisconsin, we don't have a whole lot of public land there. So these birds were ultimately being released on private land. Um, but that was because that was where we felt we had the best turkey habitat at the time based on the available research at that point. That was what looked like the best turkey habitat that we had available. So that's, that's where we wanted to start the reintroduction effort. So in mentioning ideal turkey habitat, so what does that look like? If you're looking for a place to turkey hunt or for instance in, in the 70s when they were doing the recovery efforts, what do you look for in habitat? What is the turkey's absolute ideal ritz carlton hotel <laughs> habitat yeah um they they like about a 50 50 mix of open open landscape to forested landscape so um you know you think about um farm fields interspersed with uh with forest that's ideal turkey habitat and if you think about the southwest the driftless region uh it's i'd be hard pressed to think of a a better a better looking turkey habitat than that. You have the, uh, the steep bluffs that are forested. A lot of the, the valleys below are, are farmed. So you get a good mix, about a 50-50 mix in a lot of those areas of that forest to agricultural land. And that's what turkeys ultimately need. Um, other than that, their, their requirements aren't, uh, aren't all that rigid. They, um, they don't care as much about the species uh, that compose the forest as much as that 50-50 mix of forest to, to open landscape. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask a few follow-up questions here. I don't want to go too far off track, but so you mentioned 50-50 kind of clearings. Is that like prairie, grassland type of stuff? And then 50-50 forest? Yeah, yep. So um, looking at a landscape, about 50% being in grassland and or agriculture and the other 50% being forested. Okay. Yep. So what do they use those two pieces for? Is one for feeding, one for roosting? Mm -hmm. and is it hot? So what's a day in the life of a turkey look like, uh, maybe outside of hunting season um, in, in, the, in the winter? Sure. Yeah, um, they, they'll be utilizing those open areas uh, primarily for foraging. That's where a lot of food resources are available. So um, thinking about different timelines, different phases in the life cycle of a turkey, they may be utilizing those open areas. Certainly feeding is one of them. Uh, brood rearing, those open areas can also be important. Uh, if there's a strong uh, wildflower component, for example, those attract insects. Turkey poults need uh, a lot of protein to grow quickly and, and insects are rich in protein. So uh, they utilize these open areas uh, occasionally for nesting, also for, for foraging. The forested areas provide them escape cover. Uh, that's where they roost uh, for safety in the evenings as well. So when you say roost, what does that mean? That's uh, basically turkeys flying up into a tree and spending the night in an you know elevated location to try and avoid predators. Okay, that was going to be my next question: is why would you sleep up in a tree when you're <laughs> a bird that can't fly too well? But that answers my question. So you got into a little bit, but what does a turkey's diet look like? Does that vary by season or? It, it can, yeah. Um, turkeys are, are opportunistic feeders. They'll pretty much eat anything that's available to them, but uh, certainly, you know, hard mast from trees, uh, berries, seeds, and uh, insects as well during the summer months. 
and again, it's uh, critically important that um, young turkeys and as well as other other upland game birds have uh, have adequate uh, insect populations available for the for the growing chicks. And then you also mentioned two things: brood rearing and poults. So can mm-hmm. you explain? Maybe for someone who's not overly familiar with the wild turkey as a species. So maybe we'll start with brood rearing and what that is and mm-hmm. then move into a poult and what that is. Yeah, well, they go hand in hand. So a poult is a baby turkey, uh, essentially. And um, after post-hatch, so you have nesting season followed by brood rearing season. So once those eggs hatch, you have poults out on the landscape and uh, the hen raising them at that time, that's the brood rearing period. So ultimately getting those turkeys, um, you know, grown and uh, out out into the population contributing themselves so and do we have a good feeling for how long uh poults may stay with the hen oh you know use tough to say um i think it's not uncommon to see uh family groups still together through the winter Mm -hmm. um generally they're you know birds are dispersing come breeding season though Mm -hmm. so Interesting. So I I thought it'd be good to give some background, maybe what a day in the life of a turkey looks like. I think that's a lot of people pursue them only during hunting seasons and they may not be familiar with kind of what's going on outside of those seasons. So I thought it'd be good to touch on that. So um, we talked about the history, kind of recovery efforts. So where are we at right now and kind of how do we fit into maybe that region that was extirpated before are other states kind of seeing reintroduction success or yeah um a lot of other states have seen success in their reintroduction but um a lot of states too specifically eastern and southern states are seeing declines in their turkey population biologists there i don't think have a great handle on what's what's happening uh here in wisconsin though our population is doing quite well we our, our population followed a, a textbook growth curve that you would see in a you know, wildlife management 101 textbook. Uh, basically, the species had an unoccupied niche or, or um, you know, a set of resources that they, they exploit. And um, the species grew and grew and grew exponentially from the 1970s into the early 2000s. Right around 2010, I would say, is when the population peaked. Uh, That was, uh, we had about three years there where we harvested over 50,000 turkeys in the state of Wisconsin, which is just absolutely incredible. Um, But the population has come down a little bit, and that's very common. Generally what happens is this population grows and grows and grows and grows so quickly that they tend to overshoot carrying capacity. Um, And then the population somewhat corrects itself and then enters a stability phase. So we're currently in that stability phase harvesting, you know, around 40,000 turkeys per year, uh, been pretty consistent since I'll say 2013 or 14. So when you mentioned overshooting carrying capacity, so, so what, what does that mean on the landscape? Does that mean the population gets to a point where, um, there's more poults than there are habitat for, they're continuing to have chicks or? Yeah, essentially there's, uh, there's not enough resources available on the landscape to meet the demand of the, the population at that level. And again, that's very common when you have a species that's reintroduced. They grow and grow and grow. um, And then eventually they hit a point where uh, nature just kind of corrects itself. And, um, you know, the carrying capacity itself is, I'd say, kind of a moving target. Um, Some years the the landscape can handle more birds than others. Um, But in general, we're we're very stable now um, and have reached, again, that, that stability phase in the population where uh, we can expect to harvest about 40,000 birds or so in the, in the spring season. So are there factors that may affect uh, carrying capacity? It's, it's obviously, it's not just in a vacuum. So mm-hmm. is, are those, is that things like weather? You mentioned habitat being absolutely crucial, but so what, what types of things can maybe cause fluctuations in population other than regulated harvest? Yeah, certainly food resources, um, nesting and brood rearing conditions are a big one for upland game birds. These, uh, These species are fairly short-lived. Turkeys lesser to an extent than, say, a pheasant or quail. Uh, But these species are relatively short-lived, but they produce a lot of eggs, tend to produce a lot of young under ideal conditions. So uh, they kind of have a boom or bust strategy in in some regards. And so those nesting and brood rearing conditions can be really critical to um, the population levels and and what hunters see out in the woods in the fall. If, uh, say, for example, if we have a really cold nesting season, 
or uh, a very cold or wet uh, brood rearing period, that can wreak havoc on, on populations. Uh, the poults after they're born are uh, fairly poor thermal regulators, meaning they can't control their body temperature all that well. So a mixture of moisture and, uh, and cold temperatures can uh, really wreak havoc on, on broods. And are there things that may ex uh, kind of affect the food source? Is that is it modern agriculture, not a lot of waste crop? Uh, what types of things can kind of contribute to that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, food resources, you know, that it could be... Um, in drought years, for example, seed production, hard mass production not be, it might not be as high as it would be in an average year. So certainly that can impact the availability of food resources. Drought can also cause uh, declines in insect abundance, which, which as I previously mentioned can, um, can affect chip growth as well. So are there things that we can point to if we ever find ourselves in a similar situation again? Are there certain things we can point to and say, well, this absolutely worked. Once we got the turkeys here, these were key things that really brought us from step one to step three, where we were, we're at now with really a world-class turkey hunting, but you looking back at where we were. So obviously it's not just a straight line. Are there things we can point to that maybe worked the best or maybe was it nature related or... Well, you know, just looking at the landscape, uh, you know, it's habitat, habitat, habitat. That's the single most important factor for pretty much any wildlife population. So uh, assuming no large scale changes to, to habitat to our landscape in Wisconsin, you know, we expect turkeys to persist because, um, again, especially in the southern two thirds of the state or so, we have very, very good turkey habitat. And then certainly, you know, uh, you, know you look at the reasons why they, they were gone in the first place. Um, unregulated hunting, that's not an issue anymore. We have um, some of the most highly regarded uh, turkey regulations, turkey season framework in the country. And also, again, you know, we experienced the, the great cutover in the past. That's uh, something that's unlikely to occur again. But um, thinking at a landscape scale, you know, it's, it's all about habitat, maintaining the, the quality habitat that we have. And again, turkeys are somewhat of a generalist in that they just like a mix of of open areas with forests, so as long as we contain, uh, can maintain that, that matrix of habitat on the landscape, I think we'll be doing just fine. So to kind of close the book on the beginning to current story of wild turkeys in Wisconsin, so you mentioned that their population's thriving right now. How do we monitor turkey populations in Wisconsin? Yeah, we have a couple of different ways. Um, first, we do look at our, our harvest data. Um, it can give us some indications of how the population is doing, but we tend to exercise caution when looking at, at uh, harvest data because so many factors unrelated to the population can impact harvest, like poor weather, for example. So, um, But it's, it's one thing, certainly, that we can use, and um, its real value, I think, is looking at long-term trends uh, in harvest to get a better idea of what's happening in the population. Mm -hmm. And then we also do uh, our 10 week brood surveys during the summer months. And uh, well, uh, well, DNR staff are out and about in the field doing their, their daily work. Uh, during that 10 week period, if they observe broods, they can uh, denote that and then submit their data at the end of the season. So it gives us an index of how the uh, reproduction was for that year. So would a brood be, actually first, what is a brood? And would a brood be e easy to spot? So is it something you could, so comparing it to like a fawn, you can be standing pretty much on a fawn and completely miss it. So are those yep. broods, are they kind of, is that a, uh, kind of a fact of evolution that they're, they're well camouflaged? Or, so where would you typically find one and would it be easy to spot? Yeah, so the brood itself, a brood is a, a group of young chicks or poults with a hen. Um, and typically folks see them while the broods are out uh, foraging, mostly. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, some species like pheasant, they stay fairly close to roads, so they're, they're fairly easy um, to observe uh, with turkeys, too. Um, while they're out foraging in an open agricultural field, too, they, they, may, be, um, they may be visible as well. So we've, we've got these methods that we use to monitor turkey populations, and we've got a history of data, which is great. So how, do, how does this data come into play, whether through uh, tag allocation, permits, things like that? So where does it all come full circle? So we collect this data, surveys, hunter data, things like that. How do we use it? 
Yeah, um, ultimately it, it informs management decisions, primarily the, uh, the allocation of, of permits for spring and fall season. So can you talk about the hunting opportunities in Wisconsin? Maybe we can start with spring, mm -hmm. maybe differences. And so for the people listening who may not be familiar, we have two turkey seasons. And I think it'd be safe to say that spring is definitely more popular. By far. Um, yeah. Get a lot more hunting pressure there. So, And then we have the fall season. So can you maybe explain uh, the differences in maybe hunting tactics? Is the season length the same? We mentioned that participation differs, but mm -hmm. um, is there a reason for that, do you think? I think so. Um, yeah, so I guess just kind of differentiating the spring from the fall. The spring season runs for about six weeks. Uh, it's broken up into different time periods. And primarily the tactics used for hunting turkeys in the spring is um, utilizing breeding behavior of turkeys, using calls to bring them in to you. Um, certainly some folks uh, want to pattern turkeys just to give themselves a good idea of where to set up or put up their blind, for example. But ultimately in the spring, a lot of us are using calls to bring turkeys into us. In the fall, it's a bit different. It's not the breeding season. Um, the fall is a fairly long season that, uh, that runs into um, early January. So it's a, it's a bit longer season. And tactics are, are quite different. Uh, folks are, instead of trying to bring birds to them, they're oftentimes going to the birds. They're patterning them to figure out where they're coming off their roost and foraging. Um, and, and a lot of fall turkey hunters also use dogs. That's one unique thing about the fall season is that hunters are allowed to use dogs. So the general tactic there is um, folks will locate a, a flock of turkeys. They'll use a dog to disperse the turkeys. And then they'll use a call, a uh, kiki call is, is what it's called, to bring the birds back together. <clears throat> and so uh, that provides opportunities then for, for harvesting. They'll, they'll uh, lie in wait and, and try and call the birds in um, to recongregate that, that flock. So yeah, in terms of participation, we get a lot more people participating in the spring season. And ultimately, I think that's just a matter of opportunity. In the spring, there's not much else to be hunting other than, than turkeys. A lot of people are passionate about spring turkey hunting. It's one of the first things you can hunt in the year. The weather's nice. The weather can be nice. This year it was yeah, kind of hit or miss. We true. went from uh, the, I believe, the snowiest April on record for the youth season in first period to record heat by the uh, by the sixth period. But overall, yes, the, the weather tends to be very pleasant, and you're not competing against any other seasons. Whereas in the fall, hunters are balancing fall turkey season with pheasant hunting or, or deer hunting. And, or waterfall hunting. So there's a lot of other opportunities available to hunters at the time. And I think that's why we've seen um, a lot lower participation in the fall and have ultimately seen some pretty drastic declines in fall hunting participation over the last 15 years or so. And I think the other interesting thing too is, and I think this just changed, will change for this year, so the 2018 fall season. So spring is a draw. Correct. Which means that you put in your top choices for period and zone and then it's a random draw for that and then fall is not fall is over the counter for permits can you explain Correct. kind of the differences in that and why that may be yeah so in the spring again we still have much higher participation um you know having upwards of um you know you're talking tons and tons of, of applicants for permits still whereas in the fall we've seen significant declines in the number of people applying so Yes, for the spring, uh, folks still have to uh, apply in early December by early December for uh, a spring turkey permit. Um, the drawing is conducted generally in early January, and folks are notified shortly after if they received a permit. And that all comes back to demand. Um, it's again, we have a lot of people applying for uh, for tags, so we need to, um, uh, I guess, control the pressure put on the population and, and try and spread that pressure out across the season as well. For the fall, as I previously mentioned, we've seen large, large declines in participation. Um, if there's a season that can impact the population, it's generally the fall. In the spring, we're harvesting males only. In the fall, you have the opportunity to, to harvest a hen. So we looked very, very carefully at the fall season. And ultimately, what we, uh, what we discovered is that not only are we seeing declines in, in fall turkey hunter participation, but we're seeing declines in effort too. Our typical fall turkey hunter now is an archery deer hunter that's purchasing a, a fall turkey tag to uh, opportunistically harvest a turkey should it 
happen to wander by their deer stand. So um, that's not only, so not only have we seen fewer people participating, but we've been seeing our success rates declining. And so when we were looking at the, the permit allocations and the harvest data, it, um, it was pretty clear to us that by eliminating the drawing, removing that you know one administrative step that people have to remember, they have to remember to apply in advance and, and pay the $3 application fee. I guess we looked at this ultimately as a simplification for fall turkey hunters. Now they can simply walk into a DNR customer service center or one of our licensed vendors, purchase a fall turkey license, purchase a stamp if they don't have that already, and then they receive a, a permit of their choice uh, when they purchase that license. So I don't mean to put you on the spot here, Mark, but would it be safe to say that it's more difficult to hunt turkeys in the fall versus the spring, or does that really all come down to kind of your style of hunting? Yeah, I think it comes down to style. You know, I know people that are highly effective with, with dogs in the fall, so I think it comes down to what style of hunting do you, do you enjoy. Um, I'd say, yes, you know, success rates are a bit lower in the fall compared to the spring, but Again, it depends. Are you an archery hunter that's just hoping a turkey's going to wander by, or do you have a, a turkey dog that, that you get out regularly with and um, actively pursue turkeys? So I think it largely depends on your, uh, your style of hunting. And I think an important thing to highlight, too, that these seasons, which are very different in some ways, but the thing that they have in common, and the thing I love about turkey hunting is just it's so interactive. I've had days when I didn't shoot a turkey, but I heard turkeys that were as good as any day I've had deer hunting when I didn't see anything. So I think it, they're interactive in different ways, whether you're, you're calling in a tom, you're decoying, you're using dogs or that kiki call, but I think that's just something that is really a great way to get people into hunting. It's fun to hunt with a buddy for turkeys. If you got a call man, that's always good. Um, so I, I think that's just something that's really important to highlight with turkey hunting that may be a little different from um, kind of the sit deer hunting, for example, that a lot of people do in Wisconsin, where you may be in a box blind for an entire day, you're stationary, turkey, uh, you're running a gun. And, it's very interactive, yep. and you're calling and birds are calling back, and it's it's quite the thrill. You don't, For me personally, I don't need to harvest a bird for it to be a successful hunt if if I can call a bird in, you know, get him a little bit interested, have him yelping or, you know, get him gobbling back at me a little bit, it's a, it's a day well spent in the woods. So I wanted to kind of just wrap up the draw issue because looking at the social media pages and some of the emails that I get, a lot of it is people asking, well, why the heck do we have a draw for, for spring turkey? Mm -hmm. uh, other states don't. I don't see why Wisconsin does it, but there are absolute concrete reasons for that so I, I was just wondering if you can reiterate um, you already discussed fall and why we don't have a draw in the fall but if you could just kind of touch again on why it's set up as a draw for the spring turkey season sure yeah um, largely it's due to the hunting pressure um, the we have some of the highest hunter densities in the country here in Wisconsin um, and you know we're we're looking at about 140, 145,000 turkey hunters in the spring on the landscape. These folks are in full camo. They're shooting at targets at, at ground level. Um, so I guess I'll tie the drawing as well to the to the time periods because the it's good to look at the the season holistically um, to understand really why it's set up that way. So we have the drawing in place to um, to limit pressure first and foremost. Um, make sure that we're not putting, you know, too much pressure on the population when we know that uh, there's a lot of interest in, in spring turkey hunting. But at the same time, we want to provide as many opportunities to folks as possible. So we've broken the season down into six time periods. Um, and, we, you know, it's provided a number of, of different benefits. The, having the different time periods in place spreads that pressure out throughout the season. It keeps our interference rates very low. And um, really, it, it helps in a number of other ways, too. Um, not Beyond just spreading that pressure out, um, I believe it creates a safer hunt. This spring season, we had zero turkey hunting accidents, and that's, it's something that is really important to the department is the safety element. Um, again, these are folks in full camo. They're, shooting at, they're hiding behind decoys. They're shooting at, uh, at species at ground level. So... There is a lot of potential for, for safety issues with turkey hunting. 
And uh, we've had a very safe hunt here uh, compared to national averages. Uh, I believe two out of the last three years we've had zero turkey hunting accidents. And that's something that I think we all really value as turkey hunters and, um, and, and really stress as one important component of the season as well. And then the other uh, element of, of having the time periods is um, gaining access to private lands. We know that somewhere upwards of 80% of turkey hunters at least hunt some private lands for turkeys. So by having these time periods, the idea is that it opens up private lands uh, to access. If you have a friend that owns some land and is a turkey hunter, um, he may hunt one period out of, one or two periods out of the season. That means there's five or four or five periods that are available for other people to come hunt as well. So, um, you know, I, I, I occasionally hear from folks and, and less, they're, they're less criticizing the season and more looking for information in my experience. And when we explain why the season is set up the way it is, I think a lot of people get on board with it. And for, uh, for our turkey hunters, we send out a survey every year and the support for the current season framework is overwhelming. You know, again, we occasionally hear from people that aren't happy. Maybe they didn't get a permit they wanted that year. But at the end of the day, 75, 80% of turkey hunters have expressed that they're, they're satisfied with the current season framework. And I think that's, that's a major accomplishment nowadays to have 80% of people agree on anything. But, and, uh, and I think the really interesting part of that is 75 to 80% of people approve of the seasons. 75 to 80% of hunters don't harvest turkeys. Yeah. So do we know what, what kind of the success rate sits at in the spring? Yeah, it varies by, by time period. You know, across the whole season, we're looking at about 20%. Um, by the late time periods, it's down into the mid-teens, low-teens. Um, in the early time periods, it's in the upper 20s usually. But averaged across all six time periods, we're looking at about 20%, which is a, a very, very solid success rate. And, I, yeah, I just think that's interesting because it proves that um, considering the season successful is not directly tied to harvesting a bird. And I think that goes back to the, how fun it is to, to hunt with a buddy, whether you like to hunt with your dog, the interactivity of all of it. I just think it's, it's not always tied to harvest. And that's something that we try to kind of preach throughout all these species. But, um, and one other thing that I wanted to just touch on. So I think you did a great job of explaining um, the periods, the draw process, things like that. So not to keep comparing it to deer, but deer we have uh, these management units by county. So what do what do the management units look like for turkey? Um, they're fairly large now. So we have the seven different zones uh, throughout the state. Historically, we had upwards of 40 zones. And when we were working on the turkey management plan several years ago, we heard from hunters that they felt a little too restricted by the smaller units that we had. Um, they wanted to hunt larger geographic areas, plain and simple, which is, is very understandable. And given that by that point in time, the population was very healthy. They were established throughout the state. We had turkeys in all 72 counties. We didn't need that fine level, that fine scale management anymore. Um, and we also know, again, turkeys are fairly generalists, uh, when it comes to their habitat. So, um, Again, there's not really a need for fine scale management to have one management unit that's slightly different in cover um, split out from another management unit. Mm -hmm. So we consolidated those 40 some management units into the current seven um, based on, on hunter feedback and, and just our feel for um, less of a need for that fine scale management mm -hmm. now. And that t all ties back into two on, on what zone and period you're applying for and how that plays into the draw process. And one other thing I wanted to put to bed today, or maybe we don't necessarily put it to bed, is I have tons of friends who absolutely love the bonus tags. They love hunting those later periods. In your experience and your experience working with turkeys, do you think that they get more wily in those later periods if they've been pursued in the earlier ones? So would, would the hunting experience be that much different in those later periods based on kind of hunter pressure? It can. Uh, hunter pressure can, can factor into the, the birds can get a bit more wily if they've been pursued, shot at. Um, you know, the other element there is that breeding, breeding behavior. Um, you know, peak breeding behavior is, is fairly short. Uh, I mean, if you base your season off of strictly peak breeding behavior, it's going to be 
two weeks <laughs> two weeks mm-hmm. long or so. Mm-hmm. So um, it gives opportunities to still get out, pursue birds. There is still breeding activity, but the breeding activity starts to curtail by the end of the season a bit. So, you know, we see our success rates drop to, say, 15% or so, mm-hmm. um, 12 to 15%. So it is a little bit lower, and yeah, part of that is that the birds have been pursued, but part of that is also that the... the um, Tom's might be less responsive to calling. Mm-hmm. All right, that's interesting. I've, I've always wondered that, and I've only got anecdotal evidence, but uh, I think that's really interesting to touch on just because I think some people are averse to getting those late late period bonus tags sometimes, but you can have just as much fun chasing turkeys in that later part of the season than you can in that first part, and especially this year as an yeah. example. If, if you only had one tag and it was first period in some of those areas, there was snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. So that's really where those bonus tags come in too, or leftover tags, I should say. Um, So you can really kind of hedge your bet on on making sure that you're going to get an opportunity to to pursue a turkey um, in good conditions, hopefully during the breeding period. Uh, So that's really interesting. So I wanted to shift gears now a little bit. You've mentioned Wild Turkey Federation and and partner groups' roles in kind of recovery efforts. Um, so now, fast forward 2018, so how how do you, as the Upland Wildlife Ecologist, how do you work with those partner groups, and how do they factor into kind of the work that DNR does? Sure. Um, I work with them uh, in a number of different avenues. Um, I'd say, you know, first and foremost would probably be the advisory committees. That's a formal, formal team that the department has um, to provide feedback on turkey management issues. So NWTF is uh, very actively involved on our our turkey management committee. They um, they help provide input in that role. But I mean, this is a group really that has their finger on the pulse of of what hunters are thinking and what what changes do they want to see or oftentimes what changes do they not want to see. The the feedback I frequently get from groups like NWTF and from hunters is uh, don't fix what's not broken. They want to leave things as be, and they, they're speaking for their membership uh, when, they, when they make statements like that. So they provide me really great input on what's happening in the hunting community, what they're hearing, what their membership is saying. And a lot of the members of those partner groups are sim- going to be some of the most diehard hunters that you're going to find, um, no matter if it's Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, um, Wild Turkey Federation. So I think that's Absolutely. really a good, a good group to be keyed in with because you're really gonna kind of get it another perspective on a lot of this stuff. Whereas you're using um, science, biological management, things like that for these management plans, and that actually segues perfect into the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is, and I like to bring this up whenever we're talking with someone in your position for a game species. So the social aspect. Of managing a game species and how does it play into management efforts sure so I think something that's really interesting to talk about is this a lot of these decisions with game species aren't made purely on science every time just because obviously we've got hundreds of thousands of hunters in the state and they play such a huge role partner groups play a huge role and it's just so important to kind of have them at the table so can you talk about Kind of the social aspect of managing a game species. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it to me, so the social aspect of game management is just as critical as the scientific management because uh, if you are missing one of those elements, things can crumble. Um, if you're managing solely based on science but have zero support from the public, things can uh, things can go downhill very fast. So it's just as important to take those social aspects into consideration as uh, as a scientific so you know when making decisions um the department has formal processes for gathering public input we have you know we work with the wisconsin conservation congress at the spring hearings to pose advisory questions when we're working on uh, species management plans uh, generally public hearings are held throughout the state that gives us information that we need to make informed management decisions how do we balance the social and the scientific elements? Is there a need for balance or do they, do they jive together? Or do we need to find middle ground between what hunters want and what the research says? So it's, it's, uh, it's just as critical to me to get input from hunters 
as it is to do a literature review and look and see what the scientific research mm -hmm. says when we're when we're looking to make um, changes to regulations, for example. And I think the main point to highlight there too is it's not one or the other. <clears throat> They're both important, but it's never one or the other. It's always kind of intertwined, um, and both both sides kind of come into play when these decisions are made. And Mark really did a good job mentioning the opportunities that you have uh, to provide feedback, whether it's through those spring hearings or through management plans or, or other things like that, or if you're interested in, in joining an NWTF or something like that, they do a lot of great work as well. So kind of starting to wrap up here, I think you've really done a good job of, for people especially who may not be familiar with the history of wild turkeys, kind of the roller coaster ride that they've been on and where we're at now, uh, for people who may not hunt turkeys, hopefully this will kind of pique your interest. But So you meet someone on the street, they have no idea what you do, what DNR does. They, they know what a wild turkey is, but it kind of just stops there. They've seen a photo at Thanksgiving. What is one thing that you could tell them um, if, as you, as you kind of bump into them on the street? This is a question I like to ask because it really gets to kind of what makes you tick both as a manager and, and that social aspect as well. Sure. Um, it's just, I guess, for me, turkey is a resource that everyone can enjoy. I, I think um, whether you're a hunter or you just like looking at birds at your feeder, turkeys are a species that we really can enjoy here in Wisconsin. They're, they're fairly common. We see them um, in urban or around homes, in urban settings or around homes. So they're a resource that you can enjoy from, uh, you know, rural communities to, in the north to urban communities in, in southern Wisconsin. Um, and it's something that I think we should all celebrate, too, that um, this was a bird that was once gone from the landscape. But because of efforts, uh, because of partnerships and efforts with folks like the Natural, uh, National Wild Turkey Federation and with hunter groups, um, as well as the efforts of the department, um, this is really just a, a huge success story, and Turkey is now a resource that everyone in the state can and should enjoy. Absolutely, that was extremely well said, and hit hit on a lot of a lot of stuff that I wanted to touch on too. Uh, so, do you have any closing thoughts, Mark? Maybe I think you really wrapped it up nicely there. But um, is there anything else you maybe want to share? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, the, uh, the Turkey Management Plan that was completed just a few years ago is a really great document. And anyone with any interest in, in wild turkeys, I would highly recommend you, you take a look at that um, page through. There's a lot of good information on there from the history to the science to the management to the future of turkeys in Wisconsin. And uh, if you have any interest in, in the species, I would highly recommend that you, uh, you check out the management plan. Hard copies are available at DNR Customer Service Centers, and you can also find a PDF version online on our website if you search for the keywords uh, turkey management plan. And I don't always offer closing thoughts, but I couldn't resist on this one just because I feel very strongly about this issue. And this is purely personal opinion, but in my estimation, wild turkeys are among, if not the most underrated game, spe game species in the state. I really cannot stress enough how much fun you are going to have, whether you <laughs> harvest a bird or not, turkey hunting. Whether it's in the fall, the spring, you use a dog... Um, you find three different turkey hunters that are going to tell you to use three different types of calls. <laughs> I, I just It can't be overstated how much fun. It's just pure fun whether you do it by yourself, with someone else, uh, public lands. There are tons out there. That's a great place to turkey hunt. So if you haven't given it a try, if you've done other types of hunting, um, I think it's about as accessible and easy to get into as you're going to find with hunting. Um, you don't need a boat. You don't need a tree stand. Um, I, I just think turkey hunting is great, and I think it's really something that we need to get more people into. Partner groups are working on it. DNR is working on it. So uh, turkeys, underrated species in Wisconsin, really can't say that enough. So to kind of wrap up here, if you're looking for more info uh, regarding turkeys, go to dnr.wi.gov, uh, keyword turkey. There I think, Mark, you can find the management plan um, and some other stuff. So Correct, yeah. So that's, we encourage you to check that out, um, get informed, learn more about turkeys, some of their history. So thanks again for joining us today. So we talked about wild turkeys in Wisconsin um, with DNR Upland wildlife ecologist Mark Waiteka. Uh, Mark, I can tell you, 
Uh, I'm sure you're going to be a regular guest here. We've got <laughs> a lot of upland species that I really want to get to. I think turkey was the natural place to start. So as a reminder, you can find this podcast and, and many more, um, everything from bald eagles to wolves to deer hunting um, at dnr.wi.gov, keywords Wild Wisconsin. You can find it on our YouTube channel, TV, our iTunes channel, which you can search Wisconsin Wild Wisconsin off the record. And remember to always check out our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter pages for more. Uh, we're going to short kind of more bite-sized pieces of info, whether that's photos, videos, news from the field, Facebook Live. Uh, so thanks again for joining us, Mark. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, we hope you guys are going to find these interesting. Um, if you're looking to learn more about turkeys, we hope this was a step in the right direction. So thanks for joining us.